Hello and welcome to my review of Get Even by Martina Cole. Get Even was released in 2015 following a run of 14 number one bestsellers. Now the blurb doesn't qualify what kind of bestsellers they were and there are a lot of lists, some split by genre etc. Um, but what is not in doubt is that this is a body of work and the kind of success that most authors can only dream of. Now, whether that's the kind of Daniel Webster success that doesn't come with any artistic or critical recognition, I do not know. I'm kind of out of the loop uh, beyond seeing a lot of Cole's books about and this one being recommended to me. It does come with one of these, which if you're one of the three people who watched my review of Friend Request, you will understand me being a touch wary of. Personally, if I was to choose Martin the Cole book, I might have picked one of the police procedural D.I. Kate Burroughs novels in the hope that they were somewhat similar to Patricia Cornwell's Scarped books, which I dabbled in a few years back on a recommendation again and quite enjoyed. It is slightly inaccurate to say that Get Even is the story of Sharon Scott, Nee Conway, and her hunt for revenge after the mysterious death of her gangster husband. The prologue sets it up as much, um, however it's much more of an ensemble piece. Her doomed husband, Lenny, is very much the protagonist through the early stages, and after his demise, her second husband, Ray Donovan, not him, takes over along with other gangland figures, such as the big boss, Jack Johnson, and Lenny's partner in crime, Reggie Dorman. Through it all though, Sharon, very much on the periphery of the fuggery, is the heart of the book. And that word heart is important, we will come back to that in time. If the plot has a failing, it is that Sharon is never a particularly strong figure, at home or in the business. Her hunt for revenge never stretches beyond being told who killed Lenny and then watching as Jack and the others get revenge, and that restricted to the final stages of the book, really. Any mystery or hunt for the truth uh, the paratext or prologue may hint at is completely absent, really. In fact, it's kind of hard to describe what does happen across 550 odd pages in a particularly coherent way. Um, there are a lot of gangland murders, some grisly, and a healthy dose of soap opera family drama. Get Even has been written in what has become very modern style. The short chapters sometimes stretch to uh, barely a couple of paragraphs. The text is sparse and brisk, but while it keeps the pace up, it's maybe slightly at the expense of the heart. I never really warmed to Sharon, not just because she seemed a winning gull or because of her unquestioning acceptance of both her husband's violence, or because she is, if you'll forgive the word, a bit of a chav. That her copious sufferings fail to tug the heartstrings, there's that word again, is chiefly down to three things. The first is a curious mix of pacing and padding that Cole uses throughout. Now, the pace of this novel is one of its stronger features. Only in a couple of places would I say that the book drifted towards being a bit boring. Mostly those short chapters, a string of simple sentences, ensure nothing is lingered over or dwelt on long enough to send anyone to sleep. But sometimes we actually do need to dwell for some emotional resonance, and there's very little of that here. Certainly, that pace is a blessing and a curse at times. Chapter 1, for example, a scene where Sharon is berated by her mother for getting pregnant. The narrator switches from Sharon's perspective to her father's, back to Sharon's, and then to her father's again in the space of what can only be 400 words or so. It fails then to be a true or effective internal psychological perspective of either person. Here we dip into the thoughts of two people, but while this repeats across many, many more through the book, it has to be considered a single narrator because the various perspectives are presented across the text in an almost entirely identical way, as represented by multiple actors utilising the exact same phrases, as I'll detail in a bit. Even if they didn't, the constant staccato created by swapping back and forth like that lessens any single true connection we might get as a reader. The archetype of the short punchy chapters model, in modern times anyway, is probably Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code, but Brown sticks with one internal perspective per chapter, as does more overtly someone like George R. R. Martin, for example. If anything, uh, Nikki Gemmell's chapters, or lessons if you prefer, are even shorter, but she changes things up by using a consistent second person narrative. This system can work, and it does work here to an extent, but adopting a single narrator per chapter model might have given a bit more without taking anything away. Despite the sense of everything being hurried, there is still plenty of what feels like padding. 
Even though some chapters are incredibly short, Cole often tags a kind of epilogue on the end that paraphrases the whole thing anyway. With some chapters offering nothing beyond a bridge from the previous to the next, it is interesting sometimes to read these summaries and consider if the whole thing might have been better served by just those sentences anyway. The chapters are undeniably short, but there are 180 of them, so the book as a whole is not. However, it is difficult to accuse Cole of excessive padding without acknowledging that she is prone to an almost extreme textual sparsity. I'm going to compare uh, two brief scenes, one from Get Even and one from Thomas Harris's Silence of the Lambs. They're broadly similar, one person in each is being held captive and awaiting an unknown fate. George Thomas woke up and felt a stab of fear shoot through his body. He had some kind of blindfold on, though he wasn't gagged or duct taped, he was clearly in deep shit. The question was why. He racked his brain to come up with anyone who might have wanted him outed and could think of no one. Alright, he had f***ed Mickey Biggs over, but that didn't warrant this, surely. He had not seen Mickey as a serious problem. He was, after all, a loner, old Mickey. George felt dry-mouthed and realised he had been drugged. He could not move his arms or his legs. He was certainly well tied up, wherever the f*** he was. His mounting panic only added to his anger at not being able to see who was f***ing holding him. He could hear a door opening and someone moving around. It sounded like he was in a dungeon or something. He took a few sniffs and he could smell dampness and mildew. This was not making him feel any better about his situation. In fact, he could feel himself starting to panic. So the second scene is from Thomas Harris. Sounds from above now, or was it her heart? Sounds from above. Sounds came clearly to her from overhead. The oubliette that held her was in the part of the basement directly beneath the kitchen. Footsteps now across the kitchen floor, and running water, the scratching of dog claws on linoleum. Nothing then, until a weak disk of yellow light through the open trap above as the basement lights came on. Except for shock and disorientation, it would not have been so long in coming to her. As it was, the skin emollient did it. Skin. She knew who had her then. The knowledge fell on her like every scolding, awful thing on earth. And she was screaming, screaming under the futon, up and climbing, clawing at the wall, screaming until she was coughing something warm and salty into her mouth, hands to her face, drying stickly on the backs of her hands. And she lay rigid on the futon, arching off the floor from head to heels, her hands clenching in her hair. Clearly Harris is the more sensual writer, trying to give a taste of what his characters are feeling. Yet, the last part of the scene is also frenetic in a way that Cole never comes close to. The senses he describes use poetic skiff, a feeling of fear and panic that almost becomes animalistic. Cole, on the other hand, flatly tells you that George Thomas, in fact, could feel himself starting to panic. I'm pretty sure that most of the people watching are fans of Cole, so they won't like the accusation of poor writing it. For me, if I was a defence attorney, I'd be trying to settle out of court. You can see how Thomas Harris uses repetition, not just of words, but also alliteration, assonance, consonance, to create a chaotic pulse of phonemic repetition. When you do this in a concentrated space like this, it's poetic. When you tell us on page 106 that X loves Y because of his hardness, and then do exactly the same on page 130, that isn't poetic. It's just starting to lean towards poor. Not only that, it isn't clear what is hard. But as I don't want to get banned from YouTube, we will move on. But the hardness example is excusable to an extent because both samples come from the same character's perspective. When we learn that Billy Mason wasn't exactly the answer to a maiden's prayer on page 52, and that D.I. Smithson wasn't exactly the answer to a maiden's prayer on page 64, it's almost like a pattern forming, but these examples come from two different characters, so it's less excusable. There are other examples on screen as well. It isn't just the repetition here, it's that so many characters are clearly talking with one voice that betrays the limitations of the author. Oh, you're nitpicking. Well, quite probably. Um, but it's a little bit more than immersion breaking. Last example, I did not count how many times Lenny or Ray or anyone else was described as big or as handsome, but it was a lot. However, thanks to a piece of software called Antconk, I was able to search through the book for the collocations of big and handsome. That is just too many for it not to be poor. But then I do accept that I don't think people are necessarily picking up Martina Cole for a sensual literary experience. Instead, this is a book where the protagonist describes giving birth as like a rugby ball. 
and where characters talk like the other examples on screen. Now, I don't know the first thing about gangsters um, beyond what I see on TV and read in trashy novels. <clears throat> so I have no idea if this is an accurate representation of what goes on, and I get the feeling that Martina Cole doesn't either. Uh, Q comments about how in-depth she goes with all of her research, but here's the thing, I don't actually care, and I don't think it really matters. I picked these lines of dialogue, not because they're bad, but because they made me laugh. It'd be hard to argue that that wasn't intentional. So ultimately what you have is a very readable, fast paced, but very trashy throwaway thriller. For a lot of people, it is probably exactly what they're looking for when they're just chilling in the back garden or on a sunny beach somewhere with some Shivas Regal and a desire to read something that is distinctive, mainly for the absence of any kind of distinction. It also comes with a few chuckles and despite numerous flaws, a story that will probably hold your interest to the end. Um, also, while I'm not a fan of this inner sleeve marketing and mocked them on my friend request review, I think there is a connection here. So I'm pretty sure that if you like Get Even, then you'll probably like that as well. A link to my review of that book is in the description and coming up on your screen in three, two, one. So thank you for watching. If you're at a loose end, I think we have over 50 videos now. Checking some out, sprinkling a few likes about, and perhaps subscribing isn't too much to ask, is it?